This is Joe Dembski with the Age of Agility podcast, and I'm really thrilled to be sitting with Kevin Morris, the Vice President of Finance at JBPA Developments. How are you, Kevin? Great. Thanks for having me. Really excited to have you join us today. So I want to start here. Um, let's talk a little bit about JBPA. What sets JBPA apart from other construction firms? JBPA is based out of Ontario, Ottawa, Canada, and our focus specifically is on high-rise apartments only. Uh, we are about three and a half years old. Of course, the team underneath it has got a lot of experience. We'll talk about that in a second. We are only building for those people that have the same business values as us um, in terms of doing things right the first time, doing things quickly, and doing things for the customer correctly. And we have a couple projects for ourselves in the background that we're working for as well. That's excellent. So, so how did you first get interested into the finance and kind of operational efficiency <laughs> world? Um, I've been fortunate to work in a lot of different finance roles uh, across a lot of industries, actually from coast to coast in Canada. And one thing that's come back to me uh, again and again is... First of all, all roads lead to finance. So no matter what you do in business, it always has some kind of financial connotation of it. And finance has a unique way of quantifying things, both of what has happened as well as what may have happened. And by using uh, numbers in the right way and communicating it to the business owners or business decision makers, very interesting things can happen. And because businesses are complex, and we'll talk about, I'm sure, the complexity of construction the ability to take that data and either get it better data or analyze it more efficiently or present it in a different way to somebody who makes a decision so they get the, aha, I know how to do something with this, can really move the business forward. And this hit me in an early age of my career. I remember doing a model for a, you know, a warehouse uh, when I first started my career and I found out 15 years later, the operator was still using my spreadsheet because it summarized his complex operations into one page. He could put a few values in and boom, it came out the answer and allowed to make better decisions. And I think using technology gets you to have the, the data there better and present it better. And then somebody who knows how to look for it and present it to somebody can result in something really exciting happening of it. So that's sort of the journey. And then coming to construction, while well, there's lots and lots of construction happening, there's more and more money being spent on it. It's an industry ripe for using that kind of data and analytics to really do some impressive things. No, absolutely. So, so then let's get, let's just jump into the, let's just jump into the construction industry. How do you think, uh, how have you seen the last few years? How has that affected the way that construction work gets done as far as the digital transformation aspect of things. I will just pick on Ottawa as a city of a little under a million people. Most people, I'm sure most of your listeners don't even know where Ottawa, Canada is. If you ask where that is, it's the capital city of Canada. It's famous for beaver tails, which is a deep fried baked good. We have the canal that we go skating on every year at Christmas. It's a world attraction site. But most people don't even know that Ottawa is the fourth largest construction market in the world. We have such massive projects going on here worth billions of dollars. And so for a tiny city of a million people, you're spending billions of dollars on construction. You need to find things to do differently. Add in that as well is most people doing the work in terms of skilled trades. Most of those folks are 55 plus and they're retiring out fast. And if you took just the stats of how much work there is coming for Ontario and how many people are retiring, the trades would need 70,000 more people to do that work. And so you, not only do you need that many people, the other scary stat is for every five people that are retiring with the trades, it's only being replaced by somebody, one person. So all this more work, fewer and fewer people are doing it. The only answer, unfortunately, is besides prices going up, which they have, is you have to become far more efficient doing it. And construction is a great industry of people that work hard, do the right thing, and it's very complex. It doesn't, people don't think about it a lot in the industry, and I don't think people looking into it think that's kind of complex, but it's got a lot of complexity around it, both in terms of construction methods, safety requirements, codes, design elements, all these things. And so it needs that next step of putting in technology to allow people that are in the industry to better use their time, be more efficient, and produce more things with the same amount of time and dollars. 
And so technology I see has been very basically adopted so far. There's been some very interesting things come along, but the industry is in its very early stages of what's possible to really transform the industry, to make it something really more exciting, get people in it and get those projects built that we need to get built because there's way more than we got, can possibly do today. What do you think, uh, what unique challenges face construction when it comes to technology adoption? Um, I think there's two things. I used to always say the biggest thing was adoption. And you spend some time on a construction site and asking a construction guy, say, pick up your phone and do something with it. There's far more adoption than there was five years ago. But to get them to enter information and use the app and do these things, it's hard for them. They've got a lot of stuff going on on site. And putting something in the computer, as they would call it, takes up time. The other thing is I think the technology itself in construction is really new. Um, and it's we're having to learn when you put technology into something that it's okay for it to fail. So I see an article today that Amazon's shutting down all their cashless retail locations. Well, if it wasn't for Amazon, people would say, oh, well, something tries and it fails. And fails, things fail in technology all the time. There's a great opportunity for technology to go into construction. We're just not comfortable yet, I don't think, that it's okay for things to fail. So I go back to my guy on site. If the app doesn't work or we have to stop using because it, it no longer works for our business, well, I'm just not going to use the next thing. That evolution has to happen in the industry as well. That technology can evolve and it's okay for it to be wrong. And that too, I think, is part back to the adoption challenge. It's so new for technology in our industry that we got to get used to things failing too. And that's another cycle that I think we haven't even experienced yet, I don't think. Sure. Yeah. What do you think then? Is that is that the biggest suggestion or like the, the biggest piece of advice that you would offer to kind of leaders in construction trying to facilitate technology <laughs> adoption? Or what do you think? Um, I had somebody uh, last week show me their Procore uh, implementation and their standard operating procedures. And for your listeners, I'm sure they know who, what Procore is, the premier software in the construction industry. And this person paid, unfortunately, a lot of money for the adoption um, and had standard operating procedures. And he asked, well, what do you think of this, Kevin? I, I'm feeling really frustrated. And I read it over and it's 200 and some pages. It's a great document. And but I said to him, your fundamental business processes aren't even captured in this. And so it's a great document. He spent a lot of money, but it's not going to take away work from his folks. All they got is a manual on how to put stuff in and how to use Excel smarter. Well, that's not what the technology is there for. You invest in the technology to have a consistent project management a process, a consistent construction process, and a consistent way of closing out projects. Well, your team and the people you hired didn't spend the time doing that. So you've invested a lot of money, but unfortunately, the tool's not going to give you the reward you need because they didn't look at the right thing. And I don't think it's, it's easy to blame somebody for not doing that work. But again, I think that's new to our business is for, we need to start with what's the business process we're going to put in place, how do we use technology to move it forward, and then make sure it happens because it's easy to put something down. And then I think people outside of the construction industry, that's a second nature. But for us in our business, it's not. So I spent all this money on this software. It doesn't solve all my problems. Well, <laughs> software doesn't solve problems. It helps facilitate the process. We've got to back up and say, what do we really do? How do we use the system? And then how do we make sure it works? Because it's easy to put it in place and be done. What do you think? Do you think that, do you think it's a mindset in construction that's changing? Or do you think that there's, there's outside influence that more people are entering the frame construction because it is such a hot industry that it's trying to, it's creating some of that, that change in mindset? I think yes to both. I think just because there's so much spending, it naturally will attract people coming into it. And I was talking with a gentleman from the West coast of the U S who is an investor in technology. And he saw, he said he's interested in the space because he sees how much money is being spent. And when you look at the basic business practices, they still haven't changed much in the last while. So it just says there should be stuff within that. I think in the other hand is for like us, um, we have a ton of work to do and we know that keep doing it the same way isn't going to happen because there's no people to do it. Um, 
Plus, we know we have to turn things out faster because costs are going up and our clients need to have things done, delivered faster and better. And if you look at even the province of Ontario, which we're based upon, Canada's trying to attract about a million immigrants into our country a year. That means that this province of Ontario needs to build, I think it's like a million to $1.2 million million doors for people to live in. Well, we're not going to get there today. And everybody knows that. So we've got a real problem. We need homes for people to live in. We can't solve it with what we're doing it today. So that's also going to put pressure on us as an industry saying, you have to do things differently because there's going to be not only cost pressure, there's going to be public pressure saying, why can't you build stuff faster with more or less resources that will come and that will push stuff forward. So I think those are the forces that are pushing it forward in terms of the quality of technology coming in this way to solve the problem. Yeah, I'm not sure we're there yet. We're in very early stages. Like it's neat to look at the roving robot dog that walks through the site that takes pictures. It's phenomenal. It's very black matter kind of stuff, but it comes back to, it takes pictures and Joe, the site super for 30 years experience has got to sit in front of his computer and pick out where the things are wrong. Well, Joe's got 8 million other things to do. And so I don't think it's going to work. And the dog's going to trip over things in a very messy construction site. So again, great idea. It go starting to go down the path, but we've got a long way to go before we're going to see a step change in the way we do things. So for us, what we're trying to do is saying, okay, let's try to take away the, the dumb work from people. And so why we like, we invested in the system Procore was we said, and Procore has got it right saying the basic of construction is the drawings. You got to build from something. So Procore is built around the drawing centric management tool. I think that's their phrase. So as long as we know that the drawings are correct, it's in our system. Everybody's got access to it. No one can say, oh, I didn't see it. It's stuck in an email. I forgot to look at all the stuff. No, it's there. No one can debate on that. By having the right foundation, then more things will come from that. And so the drawings are right. So then changes around our drawing are managed in the system. So it's always come back to we're building this. No questions about it. Now we are we put in the financial component saying what we're going to bill against that is there. It's got some issues. I'm not sure I'm supposed to say those things out loud. We're working with Procore saying it affects our business. We got to work with you. I don't think other industries would have that as much as they are looking for a feedback. They're trying to evolve as fast as they possibly can. The industry needs stuff. So again, it's rudimentary. It's basic. It will get there. It's just for us, we have to be patient. I'm not a patient guy while these things evolve. And I think that's perfect. That's a great, it's a really tangible example that you bring up. And something that you that you mentioned in there too was the idea of not doing dumb. We have got to stop doing dumb work. And I think that's, that's a, I love the basic, when we can distill it down to basic tenets, I'm a big fan. Well, I think it's important because I think, you know, especially if you've been outside coming in, it's so easy to see the opportunities like digital twins. While it makes perfect sense that I should be able to take all these drawings, put them into a box and the box be able to say, here's what it looks like. That's assuming that the drawings are right and they're not, or they're complete and they're not, or they're using the same scale and they're not. Those are the things the industry has got to figure out to get them there. And then these great things and these great visions that people have will come around and it'll drive the industry. But I may even have less hair before the time that comes around or may actually all be gray by then. It's great, but it's still far away. We are still at the basics of how do you take photos on the site? How do you label them? How do you put them in the system? Somebody wants to see the construction photos from five days ago. Can I find them, identify them? Again, that's baby steps. It's the right process, but that's where the industry is in. And if, and if somebody wants to make an evolution, Think of that small step that will make the person on site more efficient. That'll pay off in the long run for sure. That's that's great. What would you say then? So say I'm a I'm a, a leader stepping into a technical construction role, and I'm looking at my the landscape of the company I'm with now, and we are not even we're we're just rolling out the basics of kind of a new technology adoption. What would you suggest to me? What what are the first three or four things that you would say you need to do right off the bat to start rolling something out. I would say, get your 
hard hat out and your work boots on and go spend time with the site super who's overseeing your construction site or project. He or she knows everything about what causes delays, waste, risk. And if you can put in a tool or technologies that help identify or reduce those, that's the first step. So for us, a safe workplace is number one. Well, our Procore system has a safety inspection tool. We had one before and we compared them and we test over them and all that. And we went, the Procore tool is very, very good, but the one we had is even better. It's even easier and takes away the dumb work from people on site. We said, we're going to keep using that safety tool and we're going to make an integration into Procore. We said, that's always been the decision. I think that's the right thing saying, is it easier for the guys to use this tool? Yes. Then let's use that. Can it integrate through? Yes. Okay. Us in the back end, the finance guys, the system guys make the integration work rather than trying to find a tool and work things around. The other thing I would say, if you're going to put a technology in place is, and for a finance guy, it's hard for me to say that we come second. It's system guys and finance guys tend to hang together and finance guys, because usually because they write the check for the system, get to determine what happens or not. And unfortunately, I've seen too often in other industries and construction included where decisions made to benefit the finance guy and the operations guy has to pay. I wouldn't say it always happens, but we try very hard and we continue to try to hard saying if something results in rework or extra work on site and we could change around where the finance guys do more work. That's what we're doing instead. So as a very, very simple example, we said a project manager shouldn't have to worry about sales tax when the issue of purchase contract, because before and after taxes, again, these are operations people make it say you only have to worry about before tax. We, the finance people will deal with the taxes and all that stuff later. We'll deal with payments. We'll deal with people who have questions on their invoice. Come talk to us. That's not your job. Make sure the boxes allow them to get all the things you need to build stuff, but then have it sit over here. So I think those are the two big things. Understand what the, the site needs. Make sure the system helps them with that. So again, go back to us drawings. That's the number one thing the guy on site wants. Give me my drawings. It's there. The people that he interacts with architects and all stuff easily for the access to it and then put all the finance work on the back end. I think it's really interesting because one of the things, uh, and you actually kind of flipped this, I wanted to ask you about how you measure whether a process is successful or not. And as we were talking, especially off the top where, you, where you, you know you mentioned with finance guys that everything comes down to the bottom line and, and what the numbers are. But I think that's a really interesting take with, you know, that is true ultimately for business and that is ultimately true for completing construction projects and everything. But at the same time, especially taking on initiatives like this, it can't just all be about the dollar figures there. It has to be about actually making tangible improvements for the people on site. It's easy for, especially when you have insight from other industries to try to layer that on. So my colleagues in finance would probably be shocked that I don't talk about KPIs and I don't talk about leading indicators and all these things. If I was in my past life of manufacturing, of course we talk about those things, but here we're not ready for that. And if you're asking for a KPI or a leading indicator and saying, what is that? Well, our biggest leading indicator is I need, our schedule says I need something here on site 10 months or no, well, has it been ordered today as we thought it would? That's the, as deep as the KPIs are. Ask me again in a couple of years when we've got our quality control processes and some data on look backs on schedules and costs. I'll have more information, but right now it's very, very basic. It has to, does it feel like we're doing it better? Do the people on site like using the system. Do we see the information in that's right? Do they see the value? If we say yes for today, that's okay. Because it's about the people that are on site. There's not enough of them. We need them to do more time building stuff. And so that's our metric now. That's great. How are you, how are you all collecting the information over whether people like using the system or not? Oh, <laughs> our system is probably a daily conversation. I know we've had four today uh, about it. 
And again, our compliments to our software provider that they are trying to push enhancements. There is weekly updates. We have a customer success manager devoted to us. Our list of issues or items we're trying to resolve is unfortunately 25 deep, but it's on, I don't think there's anything on there that's a nice to have. It's we need this to run our business and we're pushing us to, okay, we need the technology to do that. They too are seeing the opportunities in the industry and saying, how do we roll things out? Realizing that my business is probably not the same as somebody in Washington, DC, or somebody is building a home or a highway. So where is that line between, Hey, Kevin, you've got a great multi-res high rise construction business. There's things you do that aren't going to be provided. You got to figure that out. That's, I think the other nuance of construction is very wide and very deep and very different. So if you're going to put a technology in place to it, it may have to be specific for industry or may not be as deep as you would for other industries. I don't think, uh, I don't think 25 is that daunting a list. It might be for, for other people, but especially with when it comes to new software, 25 must have, I don't think that's, <laughs> that's as daunting as it might sound. Some days it feels like 2,500, but you know. What do you think, um, what do you think a lot of builders get wrong when it comes to trying to add new software process, new softwares and new processes to their systems? Um, Let I me rephrase it. Actually, let's do this. Yeah. What do you think they're, what do you think is, what do you think people are focusing on incorrectly when they're, when they're trying to adopt new software? I think for a lot of construction people, they have run their business for years as to, it feels right here. And so what may feel right here may not be the biggest payoff to improve your business. So um, I'm just trying to give an example of that. Well, I, I'll go back to the gentleman who showed me his Procore. It doesn't feel right. Well, what doesn't feel right about? Well, it just seems like they take a lot of time and they're not getting things done as fast enough. No doubt. That's the business management. And that comes from 40 years of working on a site and walking around saying, this feels like they're not for progressing far enough along. I totally respect that. But if you're trying to enhance your business, you have to be able to look at and say, what business process here isn't functioning as I expect? Or maybe it needs to be done differently. So this gentleman is spending a lot of time on a system, but still had tons of Excel workbooks underneath. Or some key person in the office was controlling everything and around the business process and how it got used in the system. Well, that's risky. But again, how many people outside of, inside construction think about a process that way? It tends to be a construction office of here's the owner, here's the key four or five people to get everything done, here's the people on site. We've worked with them for 20 years. That's the way it is. I trust you. You'll get it done. You know what to look for. If we're going to evolve where all these very smart people, very experienced people are going to retire out, and the next generation who doesn't have 40 years experience is going to come in and try be trusted with these large projects. There has to be some processes, some systems in place to say, this is how we do it. So it allows them to learn and move things forward. So for us, we put in some quality control processes this year. And um, the first reaction was, well, all our sub trays will give us their sign off. And I said, that's great. They've done the review. We're in charge of the overall construction of this project. What are we looking for? Because at the end of the day, the owner's saying, I've trusted JVPA to build this stuff. What do you guys do when you look at it? And so we've spent some time working through it. And right now we're pouring a lot of concrete. And the team on site said, well, we should look at the rebar. We should look at gaps for things that are going to go through the slab. We're going to look at quality of tarping, all this stuff. And they came back after using it for a while. And I said, how did it go? And they said, oh, it's been really, really good. Well, we missed uh, four sleeves where pipes have to go through in the slab. And I said, well, how much would that cost if we had to do it? Well, we'd have to recore it and redrill a hole and look for rebar and probably be a couple thousand bucks per hole. Well, you just saved the client $20,000. Well done. But again, for those younger folks, they don't have the gut intuition to say, oh, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. They need some of those tools to say, go look at this, go take care of this, make sure you take all these things complete because then it'll be the tool for them to get that experience and for us to make sure we're covering everything off. It's really interesting. Thank you again for the, another really tangible example there. What is something you, you, you've touched on this a, a handful of times? This might not even really be an issue for 
for JBPA. But with the reticence to adopt technology, what do you think is what do you think has been the the single most important thing to um, get people to buy in? Because I think that's something that is a really that's that's something that's a really big issue kind of across the industry. I know this is a bad software term, and I apologize. But use the champion. You need a champion. <laughs> You got to have some, and because it's, it, like everything, I think in human nature, it's the shiny new object. And then the, it, the interest in it or support of it kind of falls off because other things come along. And especially when you're building something, there's the next trade to deal with the next floor, the next change, all those things. And once, you know, it's easy to fall off of that or just do what you need to do. And I'd say we're at the point where, now we adopted Procore, so we have all our drawings, we're managing all our changes, all our billing is coming out of Procore to our client with all the backup, it's all transparent. We close off our books very, very quickly. We're doing all our reporting. We're now on the quality control path saying, okay, what things are we looking for? We've got our safety system in place. Now it is, okay, we're gonna start getting at the place with a building now, we're going to start handing it over to a client in about five months. Now there's a new process there, and it's the most difficult part of building a high rise, the last 10%. We're talking through now, what are we going to put in place in the system and train our people to make sure that happens? And that wouldn't have happened without a bald guy pushing for that kind of stuff. So I think every company it's, it's going to adopt technology. It can't be off somebody's desk, side of their desk. It can't be, guess what, Joe, you're the unlucky guy. You get to do the technology today and uh, I'd rather do something else. If you want it to work, you want it to stick, you want it to evolve. You got to have somebody who's passionate about it. And I get, I'm passionate about it. I, the industry needs it. Our company will be different because of it. So if a company's going to have something in place, pick who is going to be. And just as important, make sure that person is very well supported to make those changes. Because if it's <laughs> easy to sort of guy and say, guess what, Joe, you're going to do this on the system. And as soon as I walk off site, whew, thank God, I'll never see that guy again. Um, there's got to be some teeth to it. Not make it, man, man, make it mean, but if something's got to be done, people got to do it. Because it's, if it's best for the business and best for the people and trying to make things, it's hard to argue with it. But if it's not happening, you gotta go back and say, hey, I am while I'm the leader of the project, I need the support for this stuff to happen. And I think we're very, very fortunate here. John, who's the owner of the company, is very supportive of doing things better, very client specific, and making things good for his employees. So there's never been a doubt as to what we're doing this and why. There may be the initial, oh, it's a new process. But again, at the end of the day, as long as we focus on it, it's gonna make things better for ourselves, our clients, or the trades to deal with, it's hard to argue with that. that that's, that's great. I, we talk, we've talked a lot about making things easier for the teams. And I think that that's ultimately, I mean, that's a, a major component, if not the most major component. What about response from clients? Is it, has it, as you were, as, as technology has grown, is it involving the clients more, more often? Is it, you need to invite, involve the clients less that they're able they just trust that things are happening. You can send status reports more easily. What does that look like? Um, it's interesting for us. We're a construction manager. So we have a client we're building a building for we're managing in the middle. There's obviously architects and engineers that come to this. And then there's the sub trades who do the work. And we're the guy in the middle facilitating all that. Our clients, um, know they need to have the system the amount of knowledge they have about what the system does and why it's important to them is probably not enough. So we do spend time with the clients saying, this is what the system does. This is why we use it. <laughs> this is why you're paying for it. And um, no, there's no other option. And that's part of it is this is the way we run our company. And so you shall and will. Uh, the architects, engineers, designers, have used the system. So they're very receptive to it. Um, where they aren't used to it, I always take the architect aside and say, look at this. You can take a drawing out of Procore, you can mark it up real time and it saves it and it's done. You don't have to email back and forth, anything. And I had one architect tell me when I was last summer saying, you've literally changed my life. 
because I no longer have to download all these documents, make all these changes, push them back. And then somebody says, oh, I never saw that or that version never got there. Again, that work for them goes down. On the other side is we have sub trades who are providing work for us. And I think just as we're evolving, they're evolving too. And they're feeling the labor crunch even more. So most of them know Procore or our systems in terms of this is the drawings, this is the contract, this is the changes, this is how I get paid. And early stages, there's a few who resisted. No problem. If you're a small company, we'll help you out because that's, we need you to use our system. And Ottawa's, I'd say itself, a city that's not quite as advanced in the construction management process as other parts of the country, that's okay. It'll speed up as all this work's coming down. So again, but our role is take away dumb work. Same thing for the trades. If we need to do something for them to help reduce the work or show them how to use it, no problem. We'll do it because we want you to use our technology. On site, there's very little work or interaction those people have today with our systems and the way we do things. That's okay. That will evolve. And we'll do the same approach to them saying, this is why we've got something on site. This is why you've got to use it. Here's how you use it. And most importantly, here's the benefit you get out of it or why we need it and you'll pay for it and you'll do it. Too bad. Sure. Uh, that's that's excellent. I think so. So I think this is, this is a kind of like a parting, parting question I'd, I'd like to get from you kind of tactically about the software. And then I got a couple of just personal questions for you. So I think um, you've sung the, you've sung the praises of Procore throughout the, throughout the interview today, which has been great. And I, um, you know, they're, they're a partner of ours. So happy to hear people, you know, in the, in the construction industry are pleased with, with the, what they're getting there uh, for, for companies that are just starting to vet these platforms. We talked about eliminating dumb work as being, you know, want that to be the outcome. What do you, what, what do you say to someone who is starting to, uh, you know, vet their technology management software and, or excuse me, their construction management software you want to, and you're advising them, you say, make sure you have this capability. <sighs> I'm going to I'm going to cop out for a minute and then I'll answer the question. I think, I think the most important thing is know what business you're in. I'm in construction management. I'm facilitating projects and deliverables. If I was in another life where I'm doing uh, heavy mechanical work, building my own uh, uh, fertilizer plants or doing some kind of leisure product, I think I would understand what do I have to worry about? Am I worry more worried about the 50 guys I have on staff and where they need to be allocated and how do I manage projects around that? If I think that's most important to my business success, and I probably think it is, I would spend my time there saying, where my, is my manpower being used? How do I most efficiently manage it, plan it, schedule it? Because I'll see the benefit out of that. Um, if I'm in the equipment business and I'm doing moving a lot of dirt and digging holes and all that stuff, where's my equipment utilized? Where am I planning to use it? Because that's just as crucial. What's my rates I'm charging out? Does the technology help that? Understand that key part of your business that makes money, makes you different, focus the technology on that. And then, and then back to, if the technology you've got takes away the dumb work, it's probably a good answer. Second answer, go ask for references of people who are actually using it. Um, I know we were fortunate when we picked Procore, We'd use the other three or four softwares in a previous life. So I knew what they did do and just as importantly, what they did not do because a software pitch sounds fantastic. You've sold stuff. I've sold stuff. I've made construction sound fantastic today. It is easy to sell. And if you don't have a keen understanding of your business process and lots of construction folks don't, it's easy for a sales pitch to not answer that question or you don't know that question needs to be answered. And so there's one provider out there, which will remain nameless in this conversation, who has grown by acquiring other software companies. And so they have a fantastic suite this way. Nothing talks this way, but they don't mention that. And if you haven't used it, you don't know. And so it'd be easy to go and buy this and suddenly say, well, how come this doesn't interact with this and this and this? Well, now this doesn't support my business. So again, know those things about your business that drives real value and money for you and really know the software. Your champion will have to spend a lot of time knowing what it is, 
and go ask other people who have used the software in your industry, hopefully in your geography, in the exact way you want to use it, you'll get the best answers that way. Awesome. Thank you for that, Kevin. I want to pause. We're, we're almost, I want to pause here for a moment though, because my dog is losing his mind and he's like right up against the <laughs> fence over here. And I'm sure you can, I'm Let's sure you can dog. hear it. Bring the dog on camera. Let's see him. Uh, it just goes nuts. Uh, so I apologize for that. Okay. I think we're good now. So I'm going to take a beat and I'm going to ask you our like closing couple of closing couple of questions. Okay. Thanks for the answer, Kevin. That's fantastic. I, I think that's a great takeaway for, for any of our listeners today. So let's just close here to talk a little bit more about you. We have a little bit of a tradition here at QuickBase of asking anybody that joins the, uh, the marketing organization, their first car, first concert and first job. So take it away. My first car was a 1986 Honda Prelude, uh, red, except for one fender that was purple. Um, and the best part about seeing that car was four years ago, my son phoned me up uh, and said, Dad, we have to go down to the local Honda dealership. There's your exact car has been restored and for sale. And I looked at how much it cost. And I went, my old clunker with one purple fender is worth a whole bunch more than I paid for it. The, the prelude is a classic. So let's see. Okay. So then uh, first concert. First concert. I'm going to sound really, really old. Motley Crue, Dr. Feelgood Tour, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Um, I remember that concert vividly because the guy next to me standing up was about six foot six and he started drumming during the opening act. During the break, when there's nobody playing, and through Motley Crue, he was drumming. He could drum all he wanted. Uh, Tommy Lee did some other things that were kind of racy back then in the 80s, but it was a very cool concert for a small town boy from Saskatchewan to go see. That is awesome. It is uh, the Motley Crue, Motley Crue, Dr. Feelgood tour is definitely, it is, it still stands up today, either famously or, or infamously. How about uh, first job? First job. Um, I grew up on a farm, so you get to go work early for your dad. But my first real paying job, I think, was my dad, my brother, and I were preparing for harvest in the middle of August in Saskatchewan. It's hot. And we're going in for dinner. My dad had his uh, job in town. He was president of a marketing board and a tr trucking company. And the phone rings for my dad. And the guy's, yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, is he okay? Okay, yeah, we'll be there in a bit. I'm like, dad, what's going on? And he goes, well, one of our trucks has hit the ditch uh, three hours away from here. The truck was hauling hog carcasses. It's been split open and sitting out in the Saskatchewan sun for the last eight hours. Get your glove, boys. We're going to work. So we piled into the car, my dad, my brother, and I, with our work gloves, and we got to the Wreck at sun was starting to go down. So it was probably about 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night. And we loaded up freshly baked on the highway in Saskatchewan sun hog carcasses to about three o'clock in the morning. Got back in the car and came home. And I said to dad, well, dad, aren't you the president of the company? Like, why are you doing this? He said, son, here's a lesson for you. Well, you get paid very well tonight for what you do. When you're the boss, no job is below you. And that lesson hopefully is stuck with me for the rest of my life. What a story. That is great. It, that those, those early life lessons, you know, doing the, I can't imagine much nastier work than, than that for a first job. That's <laughs> no great. job is below you. <laughs> it's tremendous. Kevin, I, I can't thank you enough for sitting, sitting with me and chatting with me today. This has been a fantastic conversation. Um, the last thing I'll ask is where can anybody that, that listens to this today, where can they find you and keep up with you? Um, Probably the easiest way is find me on LinkedIn. You'll find me listed there. Drop me a note, send me an email. I would lovely to talk to you about construction, technology, share ideas, and like everything else, if you've got something I need to learn, I'd love to hear from you as well. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you.